Hello, I'm Robert Martinez in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I'm the state historian, and this is New Mexico history in 10 minutes. So, by 1596, Juan Doñate has been granted the contract to colonize uh, New Mexico. This is a big deal. Um, he has to pay for part of the expedition, so he's going to be investing a lot of his own money uh, with the hopes of uh, finding uh, riches, a wealth that will um, make him even more powerful than he already was at that time. Um, it didn't happen overnight. Uh, a lot of other uh, powerful Españoles, uh, Spaniards, were vying for the contract. Uh, he started to uh, recruit in places like Santa Barbara, Zacatecas, Mexico City, and all kinds of Spaniards were coming and volunteering for this colonization. Well, as they gathered um, in uh, Santa Barbara, um, it got to be a bit of a difficult situation because of... Uh, uh, political intrigue, corruption, uh, competition. Uh, the expedition was delayed uh, time after time, and this caused a lot of the colonists that were recruited uh, to desert, to, to leave. Not, not so much desert, but to just say, uh, we're not going to go. So um, the numbers kept fluctuating. But um, the good news is we have a lot of the documentation uh, that was taken. The Spaniards are amazing record keepers. They wrote everything down. Um, so that's that's good. Those documents are uh, housed in the Archivo de las Indias in Sevilla, Spain, and the Archivo General de la Nación in Mexico City. And uh, so we get a pretty good idea of what's going on. There are quite a few um, uh, muster rolls where uh, they would write down who was coming up, uh, uh, where they were from, uh, what they were bringing with them. Uh, one was a Salazar inspection. And these are great records because we get an idea of, of exactly who these people were, what kind of people they were, and what they were intending to do up here in New Mexico. For example, um, when they would uh, write down your record, you had to declare your name. Uh, they would uh, ask you your father's name, where you were from, and then they would write down a physical description. So um, if somebody's name was uh, Bartolome Romero, um, he would name his father as Bartolome, and um, he was from Corral de Almaguer, Spain, and he would be described as having black hair, swarthy, uh, black bearded. Um, this, these are very important details and you have to read between the lines because some of the men were described as black haired, some have, were as um, uh, what, uh, chestnut colored hair, uh, black eyes, uh, gray eyes, blue eyes. Um, some had sharp pointy noses, others were described as having a flat nose. Um, some were described as of a strong body, tall and slender, or uh, rotund or fat. <laughs> so we, we get, get the notion that, yes, the European people that came here were described as European, but some others were described in ways that showed that they uh, likely had some Native American ancestry or African ancestry. So that happened. Um, what else? Um, some of them brought women with them. But let's be clear, um, if you were a Spaniard in Spain, um, you weren't sitting around in Spain thinking, I want to go to New Mexico. Um, that didn't happen. If you were going to come to the Indies, to the Americas, you wanted to go where the action was, uh, Mexico City, um, great Spanish cities like Puebla or Guadalajara or a mining center like Zacatecas, where there's wealth and opportunity. Um, New Mexico was on the edge of empire. Finisterre, land's end. Uh, it wasn't a very desirable place to come, but I think for some, like any immigrant uh, situation, for a lot of folks, they were looking for a place where they could have a new start, maybe uh, have a chance at mineral wealth, financial wealth, and access to land. 
and let's be honest, access to native peoples to put to work. So this is what was going on uh, between 1596 and 1598. And a lot of the men that came to New Mexico uh, brought women with them, wives. Um, but most of the wives weren't from Spain. I think maybe, uh, let's see, Pedro Robledo was from uh, Maqueda outside of Toledo. He brought his wife, Catalina Lopez. She was from Toledo, Spain. But for the most part, um, the women were from Mexico. Uh, Spanish, perhaps, but also mixed Spanish, mixed with Indian. And some of them had Indian wives with them. Uh, native Mexican Indian women, and they brought them to New Mexico with children and had children up here. So it's a mixed group already. None, none of these were just Spaniards. Oñate didn't go to Spain, to Sevilla, and say, I'd like to recruit only Spanish people and take them to New Mexico. No, this was a colonial um, operation. So by 1598, after many delays, uh, the expedition is ready to set out and come north. And it would be a very, very difficult journey. There were about 400 colonists. These are Spanish people, mixed blood people. There are a lot of Native Americans who are being brought up, uh, Africans as well. And I have to mention them because uh, many were brought as servants, but they're colonists too. They are part of the operation. It's not just Oñate doing all the hard work or his uh, family. He brought nephews with him, uh, Vicente and Juan Zaldivar, uh, heavy hitters from Zacatecas. Uh, but he's also bringing um, a bunch of different kinds of people, and they are all colonists, men and women. And there are even some children in the expedition. So this is what we're dealing with, uh, a long, difficult journey uh, through the um, Sonora Desert uh, into uh, what will eventually become uh, the kingdom and province of New Mexico. So um, let's imagine what that operation looked like. Um, paintings and images. We see uh, people uh, on horses, men with armor, uh, with uh, helmets and uh, chain mail, uh, armored boots, leather boots, uh, horses, uh, uh, heavily armored. We see this sort of thing. That's probably not how they were dressed when they came up here. It's very cumbersome. And in the heat of a uh, desert, uh, like you see uh, in Mexico and then up here in New Mexico, it wouldn't have uh, made any sense. Um, they were probably wearing um, loose uh, cotton shirts, uh, uh, pants that might have been made out of cloth or le leather, probably heavy boots for the journey. A lot of people were probably walking. They had carretas. These were the Spanish carts. It's not what you see on those images of Westerns with uh, carts that have uh, four wheels. No, these were uh, carts that had two wheels and they were probably pulled uh, by oxen or uh, some other heavy uh, um, animal of burden. Um, they uh, had to carry not just humans, but they had to bring all the elements of civilization with them. Um, horses, cows, pigs, sheep, goats, chickens. Um, they had weapons. What kind of weapons? Oh, let's see. They had the arquebus. That was a, like a musket. Um, not very handy. I mean, if you could get one shot off, uh, if a, an enemy was attacking, uh, then you had to load it. Um, it took a while to load it. By that time, you had a, a warrior on top of you, and you probably used it just to swing and hopefully hit someone. They had steel. They had swords. Um, they had medialunas, a very uh, formidable weapon, a half moon. It was a long uh, uh, pole or stick that had a half moon metal blade that you could cut down animals or humans with. Um, this is the stuff of the Spanish colonization. They had Catholic priests, Franciscans, with them. Um, 
They had about 10, I believe. Uh, Onyate wanted an apostolic 12, but he wasn't able to get that number. But he had some that came up to start the uh, difficult task of uh, attempting to convert the Pueblo people to the Roman Catholic faith. So this is what's going on. There are hundreds and hundreds of Spaniards, mixed blood, Native American, African people coming, and they're hoping to uh, arrive in New Mexico uh, before a hard winter sets. So we'll see what happens then um, in the spring of 1598 when the expedition gets to uh, what's the area of present-day Juarez, Mexico. See you next time. Hasta pronto.